What iniquity, asks the Lord of the children of Israel, have your fathers found in me that they are gone far from me and have walked after vanity? For my people have committed two evils, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and you them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. Like the Israelites, we do forsake the fountain of living waters, and try to hew out for ourselves cisterns of our own devising. We seek to slake our thirst with our own experiences or our own activities, and then wonder that we still thirst. And it is to save us from perishing for want of water that the Lord finds it necessary to destroy our broken cisterns, since only so can we be forced to drink from the fountain of living waters. We are told that if we trust in vanity, vanity shall be our recompense, and many a time have we found this to be true. Have you ever crossed a dangerous swamp abounding in quicksands, where every step was a risk, and where firm-looking hillocks continually deceived you into a false dependence, causing you to sink in the mire and water concealed beneath their deceptive appearances? If you have, you will be able to understand what it means to trust in vanity, and you will appreciate the blessedness of any dispensation that shall discover to you the rottenness of your false dependencies, and shall drive you to trust in that which is safe and permanent. When our feet are walking on miry clay, we can have nothing but welcome for the divine guide who shall bring us out from the clay and shall set our feet upon a rock and establish our goings, even though the ways in which he calls us to walk may seem narrow and hard. The prophet Jeremiah, when lamenting the sins of his people, says, We have made lies our refuge, and under falsehoods that we hid ourselves, and he adds that the Lord had declared he would sweep away the refuge of lies and would cause the waters to overflow the hiding place. It might look, as far as the outward seeming goes, as though it was God's wrath that did this, and many a frightened Christian thinks it is, but his wrath is only against the refuges of lies, not against us, and love could do no less than destroy these refuges, in order that we may be delivered. A dear old friend of mine, who was very much interested in my spiritual welfare, gave me a little book called The Seventeen False Rests of the Soul, evidently feeling that I was in danger of settling down upon one or another of these false rests. The book set forth in quaint old language the idea that the soul was continually tempted to sit down upon some falsity as though it were a final resting place and that God was continually obliged to unbottom all such false resting places as though one should unbottom a chair and let the sitter fall through. All these seventeen false rests were described and it was shown how the soul being unbottomed off each one successively settled down at last upon the only true rest in God. This unbottoming is only another word for the shakings and emptyings of which I have been writing. It is always a painful process and often a most discouraging one. Everything seems unstable and rest seems utterly unattainable. No sooner do we find an experience or a doctrine in which we think we may surely rest than a great shaking comes and we are forced out again. And this process must continue until all that can be shaken is removed and only those things which cannot be shaken remain. Often the answer to our most fervent prayers for deliverance comes in such a form that it seems as if the very foundations of the hills moved and were shaken, and we do not always see at first that it is by means of this very shaking that the deliverance for which we have prayed is to be accomplished, and we are to be brought forth into the large place for which we long. The old mystics used to teach what they called detachment, meaning the cutting loose of the soul from all that could hold it back from God. This need for detachment is the secret of many of our shakings. We cannot follow the Lord fully so long as we are tied fast to anything else, any more than a boat can sail out into the boundless ocean so long as it is tied fast to the shore. If we could reach the city which hath sure and steadfast foundations, we must go out like Abraham from all other cities and must be detached from every earthly tie. Everything in Abraham's life that could be shaken was shaken. He was, as it were, emptied from vessel to vessel, here today and gone tomorrow, all his resting places were disturbed and no settlement or comfort anywhere. We, like Abraham, are looking for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God, and therefore we shall need to be emptied from vessel to vessel. But we do not realize this, and when the overturnings and shakings come, we are in despair and think we shall never reach the city that hath foundations at all. But it is these very shakings that make it possible for us to reach it. The psalmist had learned this, and after all the shakings and emptying of his eventful life, he cried, My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, he is my defense, I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. At last God was everything to him, and then he found that God was enough. And it is the same with us. When everything in our lives and experience is shaken that can be shaken, and only that which cannot be shaken remains, we are brought to see that God only is our rock and our foundation, and we learn to have our expectation from him alone.
Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake, with a swelling thereof. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. Shall not be moved, what an inspiring declaration! Can it be possible that we, who are so easily moved by the things of earth, can arrive at a place, where nothing can upset our temper or disturb our calm? Yes, it is possible, and the Apostle Paul knew it. When he was on his way to Jerusalem, where he foresaw that, bonds and afflictions, awaited him, he could say triumphantly, but none of these things move me. Everything in Paul's life and experience, that could be shaken, had been shaken, and he no longer counted his life, or any of life's possessions, dear unto him. And we, if we will but let God, have his way with us, may come to the same place so that neither the fret and fear of the little things of life, nor its great and heavy trials, can have power to move us from the peace, that passeth all understanding, which is declared to be the portion of those who have learned to rest only on God. In that wonderful revelation, made to John in the isle that is called Patmos, where the Spirit, tells to the church is what awaits those who overcome, we have a statement, that expresses in striking terms just what I mean. Him that overcome, will I make a pillar, in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. To be as immovable as a pillar, in the house of our God, is an end for which one would gladly endure all the, shakings, and, unbottomings, that may be necessary to bring us there. Wherefore we receiving a kingdom, that cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. A great many people are afraid of the consuming fire of God, but that is only because they do not understand what it is. It is the fire of God's love that must in the very nature of things consume everything that can harm his people, and if our hearts are set on being what the love of God would have us be, his fire is something we shall not be afraid of, but shall warmly welcome. Implacable is love. Foes may be hot or teased. From their malign intent, but he goes unappeased, who is on kindness spent. Let us thank God, then, that he is, on kindness spent, toward us, and that the consuming fire of his love will not cease to burn until it has refined us as silver is refined. For the promise is that he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purge us as gold and silver are purged in order that we may offer unto him an offering in righteousness, and he gives us this inspiring assurance that if we will but submit to this purifying process, we shall become pleasant unto the Lord, and all nations shall call us blessed. For ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. To be pleasant and delightsome to the Lord may seem to us impossible when we look at our shortcomings and our unworthiness. But when we think of this lovely, consuming fire of God's love, we can be of good heart and take courage, for he will not fail nor be discouraged until all our dross and reprobate silver is burned up, and we ourselves come forth in his likeness and are conformed to his image. Our souls long for the kingdom which cannot be moved, and he who is on kindness spent, will, if we will let him, shake everything in our lives that can be shaken, and will unbottom us off every false rest, until only that which cannot be shaken shall remain. One of the most impressive sermons I ever heard was preached by a sweet-faced old Quaker lady who rose in the stillness and said, Yesterday sister to life of broke all to pieces my best china teapot, but the Lord, whom I trust, kept my soul in perfect peace and enabled me not to utter a single word of reproach. That was all, the sermon ended, but into every heart there entered a sense of what it would mean to be kept in the immovable kingdom of the love of God. And this kingdom may be our own if we will but submit to the shakings of God and will learn to rest only and always on him. May you hasten the day for each one of us. Underline, underline, underline. Chapter 12. A word to the wavering ones. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that watereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with a wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. It would be difficult to find any one thing that produces more discomfort in the religious life than does a wavering faith. The figure, given us by the Apostle James exactly describes it, a wave of the sea, driven by the wind and tossed. And just as it is impossible for a traveler to reach his destination by advancing one day and retracing his steps the next, so is it equally impossible for the wavering soul, while it wavers, to reach any place of settled peace. In our last chapter we considered the shakings of God, and it might be thought that our waverings would be akin to his shakings. But God's shakings are caused by his love, and are for our blessing, and always lead to rest and peace, while our waverings are caused by our want of faith, and always lead to discomfort and turmoil. A wavering Christian is a Christian who trusts in the love of God one day and doubts it the next, and who is alternately happy or miserable accordingly. He mounts to the hilltop of joy at one time, only to descend at another time into the valley of despair. 
He is driven to and fro. By every wind of doctrine, is always striving and never attaining, and is a prick to each changing influence, caused by his state of health, or by the influences around him, or even by the state of the weather. You would suppose that even the most ignorant child of God would know without telling that this sort of experience is all wrong, and that to waver in one's faith after such a fashion is one of the things most dishonoring to the Lord, whose truth and faithfulness it so impugns. But as a fact, there are many Christians whose eyes are so blinded in the matter that they actually think this tendency to waver is a tribute to the humility of their spirits, and who exalt every fresh attack of doubt into a secret and most pious virtue. A wavering Christian will say complacently, Oh, but I know myself to be so unworthy that I am sure it is right for me to doubt, and they will imply by their tone of superiority that their hearer, if truly humble, would doubt also. In fact, I knew one really devoted Christian whose religious life was one long torment of doubt, who said to me once, in solemn earnestness, after I had been urging him to have more faith, My dear friend, if once I should be so presumptuous as to feel sure that God loved me, I should be certain I was on the direct road to hell. He thought, no doubt, that such an assurance could only arise from a feeling that he was good enough to be worthy of God's love, and that to feel this would be presumption. And in this he would have been right, for to think ourselves good enough to be worthy of God's love would be presumption indeed. But the ground for our assurance is not to come from our own goodness, but from the goodness of God, and while we never can be and never ought to be satisfied with the first, there cannot possibly be any question to one who believes the Bible as to the all-sufficiency of the last. To see the absurdity, not to call it by any harsher name, of the position of doubt taken up, by this dear Christian, it is only necessary to consider how it would work with any of our human relations in life. Try to imagine what it would be in the marriage relation or in the relation of children to a parent, both of which relations are used by the Lord as figures of our relation to himself. Suppose either wife or husband should have a wavering experience of confidence in the other, one day trusting, and the next day doubting, would this be considered a sign of true humility on the doubter's part, and therefore a thing to be cherished as a virtue? Or, similarly, if children should waver in their confidence toward their earthly parents, as Christians seem to feel at liberty to do with their heavenly parent, what name could be found severe enough by which to call such unofficial conduct? Of course, in earthly relations such wavering might come from the fact that one of the parties concerned was unworthy of confidence, and in this case it could be excused. But in the case of God there could not possibly be any such excuse, although the wavering faith of some of his children may, I am afraid, sometimes lead outsiders to conclude that he cannot be worthy of much confidence, or their faith would be more steadfast. We would shrink in horror from being the cause of any such imputation on the character of God, but I think, if we are honest with ourselves, we will be forced to acknowledge that our wavering faith is calculated to convey just such an impression, and that it really is, therefore, in its essence disloyalty to a trustworthy God, and should be mourned over as a grievous sin. The truth is, although we may not know it, our wavering comes, not from humility, but from a subtle and often unconscious form of pride. True humility accepts the love that is bestowed upon it, and the gifts of that love, with a meek and happy thankfulness, while pride shrinks from accepting gifts and kindnesses, and is afraid to believe in the disinterested goodness of the one who bestows them. Were we truly humble, we would accept God's love with thankful meekness, and, while acknowledging our own unworthiness, would only think of it as enhancing his grace and goodness in choosing us as the recipients of such blessings. A wavering faith is not only disloyal to God, but it is a source of untold misery to ourselves, and cannot in any way advance our spiritual interests, but must always under all circumstances hinder and upset them. The Apostle tells us that we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. To be steadfast is the exact contrary of wavering, and to expect the results of steadfastness as the outcome of wavering is as foolish as it would be to expect to reach the top of a mountain by alternately climbing two steps and sliding back three. And yet many people expect this very thing. They make a beginning of confidence, and for a little time, while the freshness of it lasts, are full of joy and triumph. Then trials come, and temptations, and doubts, begin to intrude, and instead of treating these doubts as enemies to be resisted and driven away, they receive them as friends, and give them entertainment, and sooner or later they begin to waver in their faith and in their allegiance, and from that moment all settled peace is gone. When skies are bright and all goes well with them, their faith revives, and they are happy, but when skies are dark and things go wrong, doubts triumph, and they waver again. I was having a conversation with a very eminent clergyman on the possibility of a religious life of abiding peace and rest, and he told me frankly that he did not believe it was possible, and that he thought most Christian experience was like his own. Now I, he said, when I want to write my sermons, I get up on the mountain to, by prayer and by climbing. 
I put my foot first on one promise and then on another, and so, by hard, climbing and much praying, I reach the summit and can begin my sermon. All goes swimmingly for a little while, and then suddenly an interruption comes, some trouble with my children, or some domestic, upset in the house, or some quarrel with a neighbor, and down I tumble from the mountain top, and can only get back again by another wearisome climb. Sometimes, he said, I stay on the summit for two or three days, and once in a great while, even for two or three weeks. But as to there being any possibility of being seated in heavenly places in Christ, and abiding there continually, I cannot believe it. I am sure this will describe the experience of many of God's children who are hungering and thirsting for the peace and rest Christ has promised them, but who seem unable to attain to it for more than a few moments at a time. They may get now, and then a faint glimmer of faith and peace seems to be coming, and then all the old doubts spring up again with tenfold power. Look at your heart, they say, see how cold it is, how indifferent. How can you for a moment believe that God can love such a poor, unworthy creature as you are? And it all sounds so reasonable that they are plunged into darkness again. The whole trouble arises from a want of faith. It seems commonplace to say it, for I have to say it so often, but in the spiritual life it is to us always, always, always according to our faith. This is a spiritual law that can neither be neglected nor evaded. It is not an arbitrary law which we might hope could be repealed in our own especial case, but it is inherent in the very nature of things and is therefore unalterable. An equally inherent in the nature of things is its converse that if it is to be to us according to our faith, so will it also be to us according to our doubts. The whole root and cause then of our wavering experience is not, as we may have thought, our sins, but is simply and only our doubts. Doubts create an impassable gulf between our souls and the Lord, just as inevitably as they do between us and our earthly friends, and no amount of further earnestness can reach this gulf in one case any more than in the other. Let not that man that water think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. This is not because God is angry and visits his displeasure in this way on the man who doubts, but it is because of that inherent nature of things that makes it impossible for doubt and confidence to exist together, whether in earthly relations or heavenly, and which neither God nor man can alter. To whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest but to them that believe not. So we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. It was not that God would not allow them to enter in as a punishment for their unbelief, but they simply could not. It was an impossibility. Faith is the only door into the kingdom of heaven, and there is no other. If we will not go in by that door, we cannot get in at all, for there is no other way. God's salvation is not a purchase to be made, nor wages to be earned, nor a summit to be climbed, nor a task to be accomplished, but it is simply and only a gift to be accepted, and can only be accepted by faith. Faith is a necessary element in the acceptance of any gift, whether earthly or heavenly. My friends may put their gifts upon my table or even place them in my lap, but unless I believe in their friendliness and honesty of purpose enough to accept these gifts, they can never become really mine. It is plain, therefore, that the Bible is simply announcing, as it always does, the nature of things when it declares that, according to your faith, it shall be unto you. And the sooner we settle down to this the better. All our wavering comes from the fact that we do not believe in this law. We acknowledge, of course, that it is in the Bible, but we think it cannot really mean what it says, and that there must be some additions made to it, for instance, as, according to our fervency it shall be unto us, or, according to our importunity, or, according to our worthiness. And, if the whole truth were told, we are inclined to think that these additions of ours are, if anything, by far the most important part of the whole matter. As a consequence of this, our attention is mostly directed to getting these matters settled, and we watch our own frames and feelings, and search into our own worthiness or unworthiness, with so much assiduity that we overlook almost altogether the one fundamental principle of faith, without which nothing would ever can be done. Moreover, as our disposition and feelings are the most variable things in the universe, and our sense of worthiness or unworthiness changes, with our changing feelings, our experience cannot but waver, and the possibility of a steadfast faith recedes farther and farther into the background. We in short make the faithfulness of God and the truth of his word depend upon the state of our feelings. I am very certain that if any of our friends should treat us in this doubting fashion, we would be wounded and indignant beyond measure, and no feeling of unworthiness on their part could excuse them in our eyes for such a wavering of their confidence in us. In fact, we would far rather our friends should even sin against us than doubt us. No form of sinfulness ever hindered the Lord Jesus while on earth from doing his mighty works. The only thing that hindered him was unbelief. In his own town and among his own neighbors and friends, where naturally he would have liked to have performed some of his miracles, we are told that he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief.
It was not that he would not, but simply that he could not. And he cannot in our case any more than in theirs. But I am afraid some of you may think I am making a mistake, and that, in spite of what God has said, the man whose faith wavers, can after all, if he is only fervent and earnest enough, receive something from the Lord. That means that you do not believe that God understands the laws of his kingdom as well as you yourself do, and that it is safer to follow your own ideas rather than his word. And yet you must know that a third of your doubts have brought you nothing but darkness and misery. Recall the days, and weeks, and even perhaps months and years of a halting, stumbling, uncomfortable, religious life, and ask yourself honestly where though the cause of it all has not been your wavering faith. If you believe one day that God loves you and is favorable to you, and the next day doubt is love, and fear he is angry with you, does it not stand to reason that you must waver in your experience from joy to misery, and that only a steadfast faith in his love and care could give you an unwavering experience? The one question, therefore, for all whose faith wavers, is how to put an end at once and forever, to their wavering. And here I am thankful to say that I know of a perfect remedy the only thing you have to do is to give it up. Your wavering is caused by your doubting and by nothing else. Give up your doubting and your wavering will stop. Keep on with your doubting and your wavering will continue. The whole matter is as simple as daylight and the choice is in your own hands. Perhaps you may think this is an extreme statement, for it has probably never entered your heads that you could give up doubting altogether. But I assert that you can. You can simply refuse to doubt. You can shut the door against every suggestion of doubt that comes, and can by faith declare exactly the opposite. Your doubt says, God does not forgive my sins. Your faith must say, He does forgive me, He says He does, and I choose to believe Him. I am His forgiven child. And you must assert this steadfastly until all your doubts vanish. You have no more right to say that you are of such a doubting nature that you cannot help doubting than to say you are of such a seething nature that you cannot help seething. One is as easily controlled as the other. You must give up your doubting just as you would give up your seething. You must treat the temptation to doubt exactly as a drinker must treat the temptation to drink. You must take a pledge against it. The process I believe to be the most effectual is to lay our doubts, just as we lay our other sins, upon God's altar and make a total surrender of them. We must give up all liberty to doubt, and must consecrate our power of believing to him, and must trust him to keep us trusting. We must make our faith in his word as inevitable and necessary a thing as is our obedience to his will. We must be as loyal to our heavenly friend as we are to our earthly friends, and must refuse to recognize the possibility of such thing as any questioning or doubting of his love or his faithfulness, or of any wavering in our absolute faith in his word. Of course temptations to waver will come, and it will sometimes look to us impossible that the Lord can love such disagreeable, unworthy beings as we feel ourselves to be. But we must turn as deaf and ear to these insinuations against the love of God as we would to any insinuations against the love of our dearest friend. The fight to do this may sometimes be very severe, and may even at times seem almost unendurable. But our unchanging declaration must continually be, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Our steadfast faith will unfailingly bring us, sooner or later, a glorious victory. Probably it will often seem to us as if it would be a righteous thing, in view of our many shortcomings, and only what a truly humble soul would do, to waver in our faith and to question whether the salvation of the Lord Jesus can be meant for us. But if we at all understand what the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ is, we cannot fail to recognize that all this is only temptation, and that what we must do is to lift up the shield of faith persistently against it, for the shield of faith always, does and always, will quench every fiery dart of the enemy. The Spirit of God, never under any circumstance, could suggest a doubt of the love of God. Wherever doubts come from, one thing is certain, they do not come from Him. All doubts are from an evil source, and they must always be treated as the suggestions of an enemy. We cannot, it is true, prevent the suggestions of doubt making themselves hurt in our hearts any more than we can prevent our ears from hearing the oaths of wicked men in the streets. But just as we can refuse to approve of or join in the oaths of these men, so can we refuse to pay any attention to these suggestions of doubt. The cases are exactly similar. But while in the case of the oaths, we know without any question that it would be wicked to join in with them, in the case of the doubts we have a lurking feeling that, after all, doubts may have something pious in them, and ought to be encouraged. But I believe one is as displeasing to God as the other. Again I would repeat that the only way to treat the doubts that make you waver is to give them up. An absolute surrender is the only remedy. It is like the drunkard with his drink, half measures are of no manner of use. Total abstinence is the only hope. The most practical way of doing this is not only to make the interior surrender, but to meet, as I have said, each doubt with a flat denial, and to carry the war into the enemy's country, as it were, by an emphatic assertion of faith, in direct opposition to the doubt. 
For instance, if the doubt arises as to whether God can love anyone so sinful and unfaithful as you feel yourself to be, you must at once assert indefinite words in your own heart, and if possible aloud to someone that God does love you, that he says he does, and that his word is a million times more trustworthy than any of your feelings, no matter how well founded they may seem to you to be. If you cannot find anyone to whom to say this, then write it in a letter, or else, say it aloud to yourself and to God. Be very definite about it. If in anything you have had a beginning of confidence, if you have ever laid hold of any promise or declaration of the Lord's, hold on steadfastly to that promise or declaration without wavering, let come what may. There can be no middle ground. If it was true once, it is true still, for God is unchangeable. The only thing that can deprive you of it is your unbelief. While you believe, you have it. Whatsoever things ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them. Let nothing shake your faith. Should even sin unhappily overtake you, you must not let it make you doubt. At once, on the discovery of any sin, take I John 1, 9 and act on it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confess your sin, therefore, immediately upon the discovery of it, and believe at once that God does forgive it, as he declares, and does again, cleanse you from all unrighteousness. No sin, however grievous, can separate us from God for one moment after it has been treated in this fashion. To allow sin to cause your faith to waver is only to add a new sin to the one already committed. Return at once to God in the way the Bible teaches, and let your faith hold steadfastly to his word. Believe it, not because you feel it, or see it, but because he says it. Believe it, even when it seems to you that you are believing a lie. Believe it actively and steadfastly, through dark and through light, through ups and through downs, through times of comfort and through times of despair, and I can promise you, without a fear, that your wavering experience will be ended. Therefore, beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, immovable, always abounding, in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. To be immovable in one's religious life is the exact opposite of wavering. In the 46th Psalm we can see what it is. The earth may be removed, and the mountains may be carried into the midst of the sea. Our whole universe may seem to be in ruins, but while we trust in the Lord we shall not be moved. The man who wavers in his faith is upset by the smallest trifles. The man who is steadfast in his faith can look on calmly at the ruin of all his universe. To be thus immovable in one's religious life is a boon most ardently to be desired, and it may be ours if we will only hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Faith is sweetest of worships to him who so loves his unbearable splendors, in darkness to hide, and to trust in thy word, dearest Lord, is true love, for those prayers are most granted, which seem most denied. And faith throws her arms around all thou hast hold her, unable to hold as much more, can but grieve, she could hold thy grand self, Lord, if thou wilt reveal it. And love makes her long to have more to believe. Underline, underline, underline. Chapter 13. Discouragement. The soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. The church of Christ abounds with people who are discouraged because of the way. Either inwardly or outwardly, and oftentimes both, things look all wrong, and there seems no hope of escape. Their souls faint in them, and their religious lives are full of discomfort and misery. There is nothing that so paralyzes effort as discouragement, and nothing that more continually and successfully invites defeat. The secret of failure or success, in any matter, lies far more in the soul's interior attitude than in any other cause or causes. It is a law of our being, which is only now beginning to be discovered, that the inward man counts for far more in every conflict than anything the outward man do or may possess. And nowhere is this truer than in the spiritual life. Again I must repeat what I find it necessary to say so continually, that the Bible declares from beginning to end that faith is the law of the spiritual life, and that according to our faith it always shall be and always will be unto us. Then, since faith and discouragement cannot, in the very nature of things, exist together, it is perfectly manifest that discouragement must be an absolute barrier to faith, and that where discouragement rules, the converse to the law of faith must rule also, and it shall be to us, not according to our faith, but according to our discouragement. In fact, just as courage is faith in good, so discouragement is faith in evil, and, while courage opens the door to good, discouragement opens it to evil. An allegory that I heard very early in my Christian life has always remained in my memory as one of those warnings to motorists that we often see at the top of hills on country roads. This hill is dangerous, and it has many a time warned me away from the dangerous descent of discouragement. The allegory declared that once upon a time Satan, who desired to entrap a devoted Christian worker, allied a council of his helpers to decide on the best way of doing it, and to ask for volunteers. After the case had been explained, Anin offered himself to do the work. How will you do it? 
Ask Satan. Oh, replied the imp, I will paint you in the delights and pleasures of a life of sin in such glowing colors that you will be eager to enter upon it. That will not do, said Satan, shaking his head. The man has tried sin and he knows better. He knows it leads to misery and ruin and he will not listen to you. Then another imp offered himself and again Satan asked, what will you do to win the man over? I will picture to him the trials and the self-denials of a righteous life and will make him eager to escape from them. Ah, that will not do either, said Satan, for he has tried righteousness and he knows that its paths are paths of peace and happiness. Then a third imp started up and declared that he was sure he could bring the man over. Why, what will you do, asked Satan, that you are so sure? I will discourage his soul, replied the imp triumphantly. That will do, that will do, exclaimed Satan, you will be successful. Go and bring back your victim. An old Quaker has this saying, all discouragement is from the devil, and I believe he stated a far deeper and more universal truth than we have yet fully understood. Discouragement cannot have its source in God. The religion of the Lord Jesus Christ is a religion of faith, of good cheer, of courage, of hope that makes not ashamed. Be discouraged, says our lower nature, for the world is a place of temptation and sin. Be of good cheer, says Christ, for I have overcome the world. There cannot possibly be any room for discouragement in a world which Christ has overcome. We must settle it then, once for all, that discouragement comes from an evil source, only and always. I know this is not the general idea, at least in the spiritual region of things. In temporal things, perhaps, we have more or less learned that discouragement is foolish and even wrong, but, when it comes to spiritual things, we are apt to reverse the order and make that commendable in one case, which is reprehensible in the other, and we even succeed in persuading ourselves that to be discouraged is a very pious state of mind and an evidence of true humility. The causes for our discouragement seem so legitimate that to be discouraged seems to our short-sightedness the only right and proper state of mind to cultivate. The first and perhaps the most common of these causes is the fact of our own incapacity. It is right for us to be cast down, we think, because we know ourselves to be such poor, miserable, good-for-nothing creatures. It would be presumption in the face of such incapacity to be anything but discouraged. Moses is an illustration of this. The Lord had called him to lead the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, and Moses, looking at his own natural infirmities and weaknesses, was discouraged and tried to excuse himself, I am not eloquent, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. They will not believe me nor hearken unto my voice. Naturally, one would think that Moses had plenty of cause for discouragement, and for discouragement very similar to that which is likely to assail us when, because of our distrust in our own eloquence or our own power to convince those to whom we are to be sent, we shrink from the work to which the Lord may be calling us. But notice how the Lord answered Moses, for in the same way I am convinced does he answer us. He did not do what no doubt Moses would have liked best, try to convince him that he really was eloquent or that his tongue was not slow of speech. He passed all this by as being of no account whatever, and simply called attention to the fact that, since he had made man's mouth and would himself be with a mouth he had made, there could not possibly be any cause for discouragement, even if Moses did have all the infirmities of speech of which he had complained. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who makes the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. When the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, telling him that he had organized him to be a prophet to the nations, Jeremiah felt himself to be entirely unequal to such a work, and said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord answered, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatever I say to thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Gideon is another illustration. The Lord had called him to undertake the deliverance of his people from the oppression of the Midianites, and had said to him, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hands of the Midianites, have I not sent thee? This ought to have been enough for Gideon, but he was a poor unknown man, of no family or position, and no apparent fitness for such a great mission, and, looking at himself and his own deficiencies, he naturally became discouraged, and said, Wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Other men, he felt, who had power and influence, might perhaps accomplish this great work, but not one so poor and insignificant as himself. How familiar this sort of talk must sound to the victims of discouragement among my readers, and how sensible and reasonable it seems. But what did the Lord think of it? 
and the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man simply and only the promise, Surely I will be with thee. Not one word of encouragement did he give Gideon, nor does he give us as to our own capacities or fitness for the work required, but merely the bare statement of the fact of being sufficient, for all possible needs, I will be with thee. To all words of discouragement in the Bible this is the invariable answer, I will be with thee, and it is an answer that precludes all possibility of argument or of any further discouragement. I thy, creator and thy redeemer, I thy strength and thy wisdom, I thy omnipresent and omniscient God, I will be with thee, and will protect thee through everything, no enemy shall hurt thee, no strife of tongues shall disturb thee, my presence shall be thy safety and thy sure defense. One would think that in the face of such assertions as these not even the most faint-hearted among us could find any loophole for discouragement. But discouragement comes in many subtle forms, and our spiritual enemies attack us in many disguises. Our own special makeup or temperament is one of the most common and insidious of our enemies. Other people who are made differently can be cheerful and courageous, we think, but it is right that we should be discouraged when we see the sort of people we are, how foolish, how helpless, how unfit to grapple with any enemies. And there would indeed be ample cause for discouragement if we were to be called upon to fight our battles ourselves. We would be right in thinking we could not do it. But if the Lord is to fight them for us, it puts an entirely different complexion on the matter, and our want of ability to fight becomes an advantage instead of a disadvantage. We can only be strong in and when we are weak in ourselves, and our weakness, therefore, is in reality our greatest strength.